Hello everyone, I'm Frank Garza with Lean Startup Company, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Today's topic is life lessons we can learn from founders, and moderating the discussion is our own Lean Startup Company faculty member, Elliot Susel. Our guest is Noam Wasserman, author of Life as a Startup and the Founder's Dilemmas. Noam is a speaker at this year's Lean Startup Conference from November 14th to 16th in downtown Las Vegas, and today's show is a preview of his talk. So with that, I'll hand things off to Elliot. Hello, my friends, and welcome to this week's webcast. My name is Elliot Susel, and today we are going to be talking with Noam Wasserman, the founding director of the Founder Central Initiative at the University of Southern California, the Lemon Chair in Entrepreneurship, uh, the author of the best-selling The Founder's Dilemma, and author of the new book, Life is a Startup. Noam, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Elliot. Thanks for having me. Today, we are going to be talking about the best practices that founders can teach us about team building, making decisions, and managing change. I am personally really excited about this topic, but before we dive right in, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, Tell us about your background and where you're working now. Uh, Sure. I don't know how far back you want us to go, but I started life as an engineer. Mm. Um, And then from there, started realizing a bunch of things around uh, the importance, even for engineers, of understanding the people dimensions of what we have to go and do to be able to go and create the the world-changing things that we want to go and craft. Wait, wait, wait. You mean we need to care about the people for whom we're building things? (laughs) Yes, unfortunately. Well, there's the people for whom we're building things, but also the people with whom we're building things. Ah. Nice. Uh, the, the customers, if anything, are the ones that, if we do focus on anyone besides ourselves as engineers, it is the customers. And a key thing is that we then neglect to think about the team that we're building it with. Mm. Uh, we're so focused on products, so focused on idea. Um, and as it turns out, along the way, I, I had my own experiences as a founder. I had my own experiences as a venture capitalist, seeing founding team after founding team coming through. And from those experiences, I realized how critical it was for us to make sure that we understood the people part of it. But when I went into, as I was heading into academia, went into going and finding what do we know about this that we can then go and be able to teach the future founders of the world, found that there was nothing systematic that we knew about those key people issues beyond a very small bit of research that had been done that showed how critical they were. Uh, so you, so you have some systems to go address these things? Uh, so is it how critical it was to... Not as so. Let me go back up a drip in terms of when my realization came. Yeah. Um, I ran into an article that was published now almost 30 years ago uh, by a guy who became a pretty close uh, colleague of mine at HBS, um, a guy named Bill Solomon. And he was going in and trying to understand within the venture capital firms what do VCs do? And fortunately, along the way, it's a very long paper, there's a very small piece of it, but for me, it was fundamental. Along the way, he fortunately also thought to ask about the parts of their portfolios that we would never hear about. The ones that had failed, the ones that despite all of that huge potential of they were able to go and attract a scarce VC dollar, um, why did they not go and have the impact on the world that everyone thought they were going to have? And what he found was that uh, there were a whole bunch of things around product, around customers, around the market and things like that, that were 35% of the reasons for failure of these high potential startups, but that that was swamped by the 65% that failed because of people problems. Failed because of the tensions between the founders, uh, because of the friction between them and the other people who came aboard to help them scale and grow and be able to round out the team. And so to me, that was the critical place to look. If we're gonna go and move the needle on the failure rate within startups, um, the biggest reason for failure is the best place to go and look. And yet no one had picked up on that. No one had gone and understood what are even the early people decisions that go awry, let alone how to go and do them better? And so that's what, for the last 20 years, that's been the pursuit of being able to go and define the roadmap of key forks in the road where founders don't even oftentimes realize they're making a fateful decision around the people they're with. Um, and then as they go forward with the venture, how can they go make better decisions to go and heighten the chances of success rather than heighten the chances of they're hitting the 65% slice of the failure pie? And so. That's what the initial decade of my life in academia was going and doing. Um, And then over the last decade since then, I've been going a little bit bigger picture and 
trying to also understand a bunch of the life implications, not just the founding team implications. And so uh, that first decade was essentially lessons for founders. And then now I've been focusing on lessons from founders <laughs> for the rest of us to be able to go and understand uh, how to be able to make decisions better, things we can learn from founders when they're doing that. How do we go and manage change better than we typically do? Um, these are things that all humans have to go and do, but founders do that in an even more extreme environment and therefore have developed a whole bunch of better practices than we might typically do. And so what are all the things we can go and learn from them about how to be able to do it, even if we'll never see the inside of a startup, we will never be a founder. Uh, we might be working in large companies with teams. We might be dealing with the personal relationships completely outside of any company. Uh, any of the career decisions that we're going and making, what are all these ways that founding best practices can go and inform us about them? You know, I really like that. And I think this is really interesting. Um, I have worked at, at a startup in the past and it, you know, like one year at a startup is like 10 years anywhere else. So like the, this idea that we can pull some of these learnings in to other places and take advantage of that is really, really interesting. Um, and I, I just have to agree with you that it is so fascinating that um, the, the people component is why the majority of these organizations are struggling or failing rather than the, the sort of delivery component. Uh, you know, with the lean startup methodology, we often talk about making sure that, you know, the customer actually wants or needs the product or service. Um, but I don't spend a ton of time thinking about the systems in place for the teams that are, that are sort of delivering those things. And, and let me clarify that by saying um, that maybe it will be helpful for you to explain more about this people element. Maybe I do think about those systems. So talk to me about this people element and the sorts of things that are tripping startups up. Uh, sure, the, there's a whole bunch of things and this is a recurring theme across the, um, the work that I was doing when it comes to the lessons for founders. Um, about the natural inclinations that we have that a lot of times it's great to go and follow your gut. We go and celebrate the intuitive mm. entrepreneur and the gut level decisions that that entrepreneur goes and makes. And as it turns out, a lot of times that when you're doing product decisions, when you're doing other things along those lines, that can be magic. But the recurring theme that I have had keep coming up when it comes to the people decisions is that our gut leads us astray. That, that what gets us into trouble, what heightens the chances of the 65% chance of failure is that we go and follow what seems natural, what seems uh, the right way to go and do things. And that that's where we have to learn how to go and pull back on the reins and have us think a little bit more before we just go and default to yeah. the guy. Um, this gets us a little bit to my favorite saying uh, from Steve Jobs. Um, Steve Jobs talked about go and follow your heart, but make sure to check it with your head. Mm -hmm. essentially you should go and uh, tune into what is the internal telling you, but know at what forks in the road do you have to not go and just default to the gut, but should pull back and make sure that the gut is where you want to go. And when it comes to these people decisions, when it comes to the passion that we have during the early days of getting a startup off the ground, when it comes to a little bit of the overconfidence we might have in terms of whether the market is really going to want our product, whether we are ready for founding, like all of these things that we tend to overestimate the, the, the positive side of it um, when it comes to the natural inclination that we have to avoid difficult conversations. Like our gut is telling us, you know, don't go and bring that up right now. Um, all of these things are the ways in which in the short term, we are making a decision following our gut that's going to cause long-term problems for us. And so we have to be able to tell what is a key fork in the road where I have to learn to pull back, inject in the head, think a lot more before I default to the gut, and then I'm going to make a much better decision that's going to be a successful one when it comes to those people decisions. Yeah, so I take it back. We do think about a lot of that sort of stuff. And one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Edward Deming, who says, in God we trust, all others must bring data. Right? I see you <laughs> chuckling before you finish. You know, you know what's coming there, right? And yeah. so, um, yes, the, the, I, I've often referred to this style of issue as ego risk the belief that we're kind of headed in the, the right direction, even though we don't necessarily have the data to support it. And founders really fall into this trap frequently because you almost have to like delude yourself into believing that everything is perfect in order to convince all these other people to give you money and to grow a team and to do all of that other sort of stuff. Uh, and it's easy to get lost in the excitement of all of that uh, and lose touch with the fact that there, 
is in fact real data we can get to support the path that we're headed on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, a key thing is to not go and lose the passion and not go and lose uh, a bunch of the things that are critical for being able to go and take the weight of the world and put it on your shoulders to start something from scratch. But to also know what are the key forks in the road where that impact that I'm dreaming of, that passion that I can go and translate into something that's going to be world beating could be defeated by another decision I'm going to make. And so to be able to go and this isn't where you have to go and create a phone book list uh, of all the things that we're going to go and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, are going to go and get in the way. And now I have to go and tackle all of them. It's to understand what are the highest priority ones? What are the ones that are most likely to go awry? And then go and tackle the top ones on that list. And then it's going to be freeing you up to be far more focused on everything else because you know that you've been able to go and tackle the highest risks that you might be facing otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, it, it makes so much sense to be tackling the biggest risks. And, you know, in lean startup parlance, often we refer to some of these things as leap of faith assumptions, right? The things that, if proven uh, false, would crater our business model as the things mm -hmm. that we need to go focus on first. Yeah, and, no, I think there's a lot, of, uh, si a lot of similarities between the, what lean has done so well at being able to have us think ahead of time in the product realm and what we have to do on the people side. So what are the biggest risks that down the road, if we found them out, that you know, this is a problem for us, we would have wished that we would tackle it a lot earlier. Well, let's do that on the people side also. What are the ways in which I'm gonna diverge from my co-founder when it comes to financing strategy, when mm -hmm. it comes to whether we should bring on a third co-founder, uh, when it comes to all those difficult conversations that we're gonna be avoiding, what we have to understand is front load those, same way that we're doing A-B testing early on to see, should we go forward with the product? Co-founders have to do the same A-B testing with each other, be able to make sure we should go forward getting married as co-founders. And so that's just one example of the realm where you have to go and be able to look down the road and then bring forward all of the things that they are going to be the negative surprises and make sure that you're tackling them as early as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we could spend so much time kind of breaking down, like, how do you identify what those things are? How do you then go tackle kind of what those things are? Um, I want to skew the conversation in a slightly different direction because you teased something that I thought was really kind of interesting, um, which is that you've taken some of these same lessons and have started to help people apply them in the personal realm. Talk, talk to us a little bit about how you're approaching that. Sure. Uh, let me back up a little bit to the founding story of why I am even going and doing that. Ah, excellent. Um, so the, the first, as I mentioned, like the first decade, I was so focused on founders and the lessons for them. I was very much laser focused in a box, essentially, in terms of my focus. I, every paper, academic paper that I was writing, had to have founder in the title somewhere. I had developed a course at Harvard Business School, Founders Dilemmas, like the first word of that course. Every day, it was a founder that we were putting ourselves into their shoes. I was in the midst of writing a book, The Founder's Dilemma. It's like a, that was my focus. And the second year of the course, back in 2010, almost a decade ago, um, I had a student come by. And mid-semester, I had been going and teaching this course to him for a while. He looks me right in the eye and during office hours. And he says, Noam, I'm never going to be a founder. But your course has already changed my marriage. Whoa. Yeah, so, well, my first reaction was to apologize to him for snookering him into taking the wrong course. Um, but then it was like, you know, the whoa um, about, uh, I'm not even envisioning what you are saying. I am focused on founders, and you're telling me that I am, my focus is off. And so, tell me more about it. And what he said was, I'm a newlywed. I've been struggling with my co-founder of life with how do we go and architect our life together? How do we make decisions? How do we go and split up the roles within our new co-founding team of life? Um, and that each day in class, um, I was seeing ways in which founders were doing it well that we might be able to do at home. And so I would walk in that night and say, honey, here's the next thing we should go and discuss. Or here's the next difficult conversation that we've been avoiding that I've seen that founding teams do that at their peril. And so it was essentially he was seeing, making that leap of seeing how to go and apply it. Um, he was in a lot of ways going, grabbing me by the lapels, shaking me and saying, Noam, you think you're educating entrepreneurs? No, this is life education. And so very much breaking me out of my box um, in terms of what I was seeing it. And then since then, I've seen all sorts of walks of life where those types of things can benefit from that thinking, the career decisions that I see executives and, uh, and my students making 
um, how to go and think differently about shifting gears, how to go and uh, be able to look at how to go and balance a bunch of the things that oftentimes get in the way of our making a change in our career or envisioning what that change should be. A bunch of things on the personal relationships as, the, as my student was going and highlighting. A bunch of things about the teams that we work in, whether we're in a nonprofit, whether we're in a Fortune 500 company, all the ways in which founding teams have a solid architecture that they can go and build for themselves and how that foundation, a lot of things that we can go and use for those other teams. And so that's what for the last decade, uh, I've been going and focusing on both educating the students and also delving into where are the ways in which those lessons, we have some firm research grounding from being able to go and extend it into these other domains of life. Uh, what are the ways that we can go and bring those home with founding stories that map to the real life stories and founding solutions that map to the real life solutions. Um, and then when time came, I decided, let me go and collect essentially the top 10 of those most critical life lessons um, that we can learn from founders. And that's what I put together into the, into the new book. Um, so we can bring a lot more of those lessons beyond just the classrooms in which I can go and be able to educate students and bring it to other people who can benefit from them. Amazing. So, okay. So there are 10 of these lessons. I imagine what you were alluding to was one of them, which is, I would guess in the realm of kind of tackling some of these things head on. Um, so that's a recurring theme across almost all of them. That's uh, very much something that natural human inclination that gets in the way of doing about all of these things. Uh, that uh, when we're going and trying to uh, make a choice, make a decision about where to go, that can get in the way. When it comes to I've made a choice, now I have to go and manage that change, that can get in the way. And so that is very much a cross-cutting recurring set of the themes that are across them. Okay, interesting. And you mentioned managing change, and this to me I think is also kind of an interesting topic to explore a little bit. Um, and I know you're giving a talk at the uh, Lean Startup coming up, it's next month, uh, which is really exciting. So I don't want to spoil too much of your material, but I do want to talk a little bit and tease a little bit this idea that there are things that we can learn from startups about managing change, both in the corporate world, and I would love to, to sort of hear ways in which you've applied that also kind of in the personal world, um, because that is something that is so hard to do. I, I can tell you from having been at a startup, I sort of pushed this really big process change, and there were folks who really liked it and folks who really didn't, and I had no clue what I was doing and how to actually manage that change at the time, and sort of since then I've learned a lot. Um, but that can be really helpful sort of guidance for folks. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. So. Um, uh, one of the key things is that there are duos of tensions that arise when it comes to uh, the deciding to change and managing change. Mm -hmm. uh, so to give you examples of it, um, first there's the people who get very passionate about going and making a change, blindly dive into it, and then get a rude awakening about how their passion became a peril rather than being an unadulterated plus as they were hoping it was going to be. The flip side of that is that when a possible change comes up, we also, a lot of times, face handcuffs. We face ways in which we have structured things in our life. We have made decisions that incrementally made all the perfect sense in the world when we were going and making them, but now have become the anti-change. Now have become the thing that go and prevent us from going and making those changes. Uh, so, for instance, you go and you graduate school, and you go and spend your signing bonus. It's very understandable. You've been going and suffering as a starving student for years. And now you finally have resources. Now you finally can go and get out of a one bedroom dorm room. You've been promising your wife or something that now, honey, life can go and start. Now we can go and really um, do a lot of things that have been pent up for us for a bunch of years. And so you take your signing bonus and you go and put it down on a mortgage. Uh, you go and uh, buy that big house. You go and sign yourself up to go and be paying for that over the years at a lot, more, a lot higher of a personal burn rate than what you've had until now. Uh, you go and take on a lot of other things. The first kid has come along, and you're going to go and bring a nanny to go and help you guys be able to manage this. Uh, the third co-CEO of the family. Well, it's an expensive uh, way to go and hire a third co-CEO. Um, a lot of other decisions you're going to make that in the moment, they all seem very logical. They all make all the most sense in the world. However, what happens when you come to going and making a change and say that it's, I've always dreamed of being in a nonprofit, to be able to go and impact the world uh, by having the social enterprise side of me come to life. Well, that nonprofit is gonna, not going to be able to pay as much as what you've been making until now, but you have gone and taken on this very high personal burn rate 
of life, are you going to be able to scale back? Are you going to be able to get yourself to move out of that house into a small apartment? Are you going to be able to go and move away from the nanny and instead take on a lot more of the child care yourself or find other ways in which this is where a lot of those decisions that you made are turning into the financial handcuffs that are then going to prevent you from going and making this change. No matter how passionate you are about it, you might have all sorts of ways that the handcuffs will go and prevent it. Those are only the financial ones. There's a lot of non-financial handcuffs that can also go and do it. Um, if you've fallen in love with the prestige of having a Fortune 500 company on your business card, um, you like it being really easy for your mom to explain to people what you do. Um, there's like all sorts of ways in which we get in love with the prestige and with a lot of other pieces of it. Those turn into psychic handcuffs that can go and prevent us from going and making a change. And so that's where we're going to be battling a bunch of those things. Either we're too passionate, we dive in too soon, or we really want to go and make a change, but the handcuffs of life prevent us from doing it. Um, and those are those duos they have to tune into. There's some people that are towards one end of it, the too passionate. Uh, there's some people towards the other end of it, too much going and taking on a lot of these expensive things, or they're too analytic. You know, they go and think through everything. It has to be 100% perfect for us to go and make a change. That means you're never going to go and make that change and you're going to end your career having all sorts of regret about never having tested yourself, never having gone and had that impact through a social enterprise. Um, all these other things that we have the two duos of the waiting for the perfect or leaping too soon. Um, and so those are just a couple of the things that we have to go and tune into. And from founders, we can go and learn how do they go and mix the analytic and the passionate to go and make magic by having each one of them inform the other, have them be able to understand what are the things to assess before I follow my passion? What are the ways in which I can go and be able to plan things a lot better in the long term? We can go and apply that to any career change we're gonna make and um, any of these other ways that we're gonna go and try to have that, uh, that, the pursuit of that passion and that impact that we wanna go and have. Uh, so that's just one, Those are the, that's the example of the first duo um, that we go and tackle and some of the lessons that we learned from founders how to go and do it. It's so interesting because like now that you're bringing these things up, I can sort of see the overlap of like, look, if you can just sort of name your underlying assumptions and the associated risks with them, it empowers potentially some really good conversations, assuming you're willing to have them. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the first step is we have to even realize that we have a hesitancy to go and have the difficult conversations. Then we have to go and identify which ones are really necessary to go and have along the lines of the A-B testing that we talked about before. One of them is, one of the criteria is, how do we go and be able to tell that down the road, we're going to regret not talking about it. And now we have to go and be able to, so we have to have the foresight of where are we going down the road? And then what are the ways in which we have to front load a bunch of those conversations? And then mm -hmm. once we realize which ones to go and have, we have to go and build difficult conversation muscles to be able to go and be good at difficult conversations. That's a skill on its own, to be able to go and have a productive, difficult conversation. Um, and so all of these things are the ones that we have to go and have the different levels of our biases that we have to get over, our skill building that we have to get through, the interpersonal that we have to go and get better at doing it. All of those are those recurring themes that we have to go and work on. Nice. Well, there's a lot of stuff to think about in there. And I can see clearly there is a ton of overlap between the two realms. It is interesting to me that um, you've gone the direction of being really focused on founders and and startups uh, and move that into the personal realm. I can also see how you could potentially have gone the other way around and been gone like and been the master of personal relationships and said, wait, wait a minute, founders have all these problems. Um, it, it's, it's so fascinating that that one student came to you and brought this to your attention. Let me ask a sort of lean startup -y sort of question here. Um, you know, you get one person who indicated to you like, hey, this, this is a pattern that was really like meaningful and impactful for me. Did you then go out and talk to other students to kind of see um, whether or not it had the same effect on them? How did, you, how did you start to collect the data indicating that it wasn't just this one person who felt this way, but it was many people? Yeah, no, intriguing question. Also at that nexus of lean startup and the, the mm -hmm. life is a startup type of stuff. Um, the first thing that I went and did was started to tune into a lot of the other conversations I was having with people where this was an underlying theme to, to a bunch of them, I started tuning into myself how I was going and applying it in other walks of my life where I hadn't really even tuned into that either. Um, I also, when it comes to collecting data, I went and added 
an assignment in my course, the final blogging assignment that the students have, is that they have to go and take one of our founding best practices and teach it to someone who will never call themselves a founder, never see the inside of a startup, but where a decision that they are making or are likely to make could be informed by it. Um, I then started bringing some of it into class where we have the collective brain of the class working on it to go and start seeing some of the ways in which this does extend beyond, uh, beyond the startup realm. Um, and then also going, as I referred to before, going to the literature, going and understand the rigorous research that's been done on some of these issues, not going and making the leap of connecting founding to life, but where they're going and taking a look at what are the best ways to tackle some of these career decisions. Um, what are some of the best ways to go and architect a marital relationship? So going to the literature on marriage, going to the literature on a bunch of these other walks of life, being able to see where is some grounding to go and take these founding solutions and then say that there is legitimacy in applying it to the life solutions. Um, and so all of these different directions where um, very much the firmly grounded in data, the uh, my own field of data from the conversations and from the blog back and forth and other things like that. And then from the solid research that lots of other sharp people have done and my taking my research and extending it with theirs to a whole bunch of these other realms of life. You know, it's so interesting about your, your sort of process for data collection there because it wasn't just sort of chatting with people and, and uh, doing the, the blog exercises you were describing, right, and collecting your own data, but it was also looking at data that already existed and it was the two put together it gave you the more meaningful picture. And I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple traps that founders can sort of run into, one being that they don't collect any data, another being that um, they look only at market data, which tells you nothing about what people actually do, but just sort of about what has happened in the past and what they sort of say they might do. Um, and, and then there's actually like going and getting like for the first hand uh, experiential observing the desired behavior where possible and it's interesting to me that you combine all of those things and I, it does seem to me like a really good recipe for success yeah no you're actually getting into something that's a passion of mine that I teach researchers about um, and that's how to do research well um, and essentially within research we can go and bucket there are two major buckets of how you should go and do research there's the qualitative research and then there's the quantitative research and one of the great things about each of them is they have flaws, but the other one fills in those flaws. It happens to have its strengths match the weaknesses of the other one. And so qualitatively, it also maps to the state of our knowledge. A lot of times you have to go and start by getting out in the field, going and talking to people, understanding the phenomenon. And that you can only do by getting the richness of it, by going and wallowing around in it, being able to experience it yourself, talk to the people who are experiencing it and things like that. And a lot of times that's where the best questions come from. You don't even know what questions to go and ask unless you go into the field and start seeing the things in their richness that conflict with the assumptions you were making. And in that sense, that's where magic can go and happen because everyone who isn't getting out into the field isn't going to see those conflicts. They're going to keep going with their assumptions. You're going to keep going in uh, following conventional wisdom or whatever the ways in which natural instinct happens to be there or real rules of thumb are what they are going and following. And you have to get out into the field to go and find the ways in which you will see things that they will never go and see. But you're not going to understand what is representative. Is this just the couple of people I spoke to? Is this just my biases that are leading me towards those types of things? And so that's where you have to get data. You have to get representativeness. Ideally, you should be able to take the uh, all very well honed of tools of econometrics where you can go and start seeing which of these are significant, which of these are random, which ones of these are ones we can go and hang our hat on. But if you don't know how to even ask the right questions to begin with in the field, you're not gonna be able to go and use the data in the best way. Vice versa, if you're going and being misled by some unsystematic data, then you're not gonna be able to go and follow in a very uh, systematic way how we can go and turn this into a real product or something that's gonna go and change the world. And that's where the quantitative data can go and inform you about the representatives. I'm so glad to hear you give that breakdown because uh, folks that are practicing lean startup often struggle with the balance of the quantitative and the qualitative and your indication there that we kind of need both of those things in order to paint a complete picture, I think is really helpful feedback to our audience. And it, it was funny every time you said get out of the field, I kept thinking of a phrase that we often use, which is get out of the building. Mm -hmm. right? We've got events where people get shoved out 
and you know, go off into the street to go talk to their customers uh, or just anybody who can give them some sort of feedback that might be meaningful. And you know, the guidance that I've often given in this realm is that if you can't speak the, sort of to the problem in the language of the customer, then you haven't arrived at a proper understanding of what it is that you need to go do, right? And if I were to describe to someone the problem that I think they have and, and we're trying to solve, they should be begging for the solution. They should be going, oh my gosh, yes, I have that problem. Please tell me you have a solution, right? And that's how you know you really like hit the nail on the head with kind of what's happening. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know you've hit the nail on the head, but you know you've hit the nail on the head with that person. What you have to do, and this is a lot of times that passion that we talked about becoming apparel, a lot of times when we go, we're founders, we get an idea like lightning strikes and the light bulb goes off. And we think that this is the greatest idea. We would want that solution. There must be a vast market out there that also wants it. You go and talk to a person. Yeah, I would love to have it. Well, that's where you have to start going and tuning into. Is this really a pain? Does it rise to the level of they're willing to actually pay to go and solve that pain? Or is this a nice to have? Is this just this person? Is it just me also in my passion? I'm only looking for the people who will confirm my bias that this is a great thing. And that's where you have to go and compliment it by, if anything, trying to disconfirm it, trying to get the systematic data that will really tell us whether it's, a, it's gonna be a true pain out there or not. Um, and so we have to go and fight that natural inclination towards a confirmation bias, towards just going to the people who are like us and being able to go and really understand from the broader market whether what we think is right is actually right and put it to the test of the disconfirmation dis rather than the confirmation. Yeah, you know so many things that are, are like really good takeaways for entrepreneurs, right? Like one is that you are not your customer, for sure. Another is in the realm of say, sort of statistical significance. Um, you don't wanna to talk to three people and arrive at your final conclusion and then you know, spend all your money based on having talked to three people. But you also don't wanna talk, probably talk to like 500 to you know, arrive at whatever it takes to get to statistical significance. So there's probably like some happy medium for a, a non-academic that's you know, pursuing an idea since you know, time and resources are, are limited, right? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. What, what, and even just going to one thing, this is where you're talking about the conference that we're gonna do. Um, one of the biases we will talk about in the team building is something that's very applicable to when you're talking about talking to the three people. We flock to birds of a feather. We really like to go and hang out with people just like us. When you're going and doing team building, that leads to its own problems if we have everyone looking exactly the same. When we're going and looking to the customers that we're gonna go and talk to first, we're gonna to flock to birds of a feather. And then we're just gonna get the confirming the people like us and what they say. And so we have to go and fight that natural inclination, that magnetic pull towards the people just like us when we're doing both team building and we're going and doing the, the customer research that we want to be able to go and understand the, the market as well as possible. Yeah, I mean, it's just so easy to fall into that trap of hearing what you want to hear, even that, when that's not what's being said. Um, and, and, you know, the entrepreneur wants to be right. And I can't tell you how many teams that I have seen um, prove themselves right after a sequence of experiments and then they get to the finish line, they're like, we're building it. And then they build it and it doesn't work. And they go, what happened? And when you take a closer look at the sort of things they had done leading up to it, they were creating all of the right sort of um, hurdles to jump that, that would make it look like they were headed in the right direction rather than actually figuring out what was really happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no, that's where and a lot of times you might get, it sounds like you're talking about where you go and get so focused on the process side that you forget about the substance. You have to have the two of them working hand in hand. And if anything, you have to design the process to be able to have this substance come out right. Um, and that applies as much to lean startup as it does to the, the people side of what we're talking about, of understanding the best process to go through to surface the worst issues that you're gonna get stung by, um, to be able to go and have the process of looking down the road and now front loading a bunch of the head thinking that's gonna be going on that applies in both of these domains that we're talking about. Yes, so I don't wanna to spoil too much of your talk in this conversation. I feel like I could talk about this kind of stuff for hours. If there was any um, sort of closing thoughts that you would wanna share or things that you would wanna sort of leave our audience with, is there anything that we haven't covered yet that you wanna mention? Uh, I think the, the 
overarching part is uh, the things that we've covered, where being able to tune into the natural human factors that are going to get in the way of good team building. Um, how do we go and get over those? And this is where the, the devil's in the details of uh, what are the actionable ways to then tune into the biases and then have ways to go and counter them that are going to make it far more productive, are going to make it a team on a very solid foundation rather than a shaky one. And uh, as you were saying also before, where a lot of times we go and fool ourselves into thinking the foundation is really solid and only later find out where the cracks are. How do we go and really tell that the foundation is solid or are we just fooling ourselves about it? And those natural inclinations, we talk about the birds of a feather flocking to the other parts of it, the avoidance of the difficult conversations, another one of those human biases that is a very universal one, avoid the tension-filled conversations. Um, some of the other ones around recoiling from real feedback. Another thing is very much both team and lean startup uh, relevant. Um, you hear something that you didn't want to hear and there's a natural inclination to get defensive, to go and not use it as the blessing that it is, that you are able to see something that you didn't know before and that it surfaces an assumption you might not have even realized you were making that turns out to be wrong possibly. That's a blessing rather than our natural human inclination to recoil from the negative. Um, and so all of those things, how do we go and tune into those pieces of it um, that are the ways in which as humans, we have magic we can make, but the we also create the hurdles on the way to making that magic. Well, I've really enjoyed our time together. If folks want to learn uh, more about you and your material, where can they find you? So we actually were just now relaunching uh, my, uh, my site so that people can get a bunch of information, not just about the first book, not just about the founder's dilemmas and had yeah, all sorts of ways that uh, they could go and do self-assessments of themselves and things like that. We now added on for the new book, another bunch of resources around that, also links to articles that I've been doing, uh, link to both of those uh, topics and things like that. Um, so they can just go to noamwasserman.com to be able to go and see those. Um, if they also, if they're founders and they want to see the lessons that I've learned over the couple of decades for founders, um, that's where the first book can fit in. The Founders Dilemmas goes and covers all of that. Um, if they are not founders, but they want to go and learn the lessons from founders of how entrepreneurial thinking can go and help them in those walks of life, that's where the second book, The Life is a Startup, comes into that piece. Amazing. Well, if you would like to meet Noam and hear his talk, you can do that at the Lean Startup Conference coming up in November. I have very much enjoyed our time. Um, looking forward to reading your newest book personally. Uh, and viewers, if you have any questions for me or Noam, feel free to send me a message, Elliot, E-L-L-I-O-T at leanstartup.co. Again, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciated having you today. No, thank you, Elliot. Thank you for the great questions and also a bunch of those intriguing observations that you injected. Awesome. Uh, friends, I will see you at the Lean Startup Conference in November. And until next time, take care.